DNA, dioxyribonucleic acid, the building blocks of life as we know it. Genetic information accumulated over millions of years leads to the formation of the organism. But how was DNA initially formed? Most biologists favor the molecular soup model, which suggests that molecules within a primeval soup bumping into each other at random for hundreds of millions of years led to the inevitability of the creation of DNA. However, life as we know it is dependent on at least 2,000 different enzymes, which are the catalysts that speed up the rate of chemical reactions that take place within the cells. We are talking about machine-like functions that take place within the building block of life itself. In the words of Fred Hoyle, the chances of higher life forms that might have emerged in a molecular soup is comparable to the chance of that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a fully functional jumbo jet. DNA is far too complex to simply gloss over as some accident. Anyone will realize this when one takes the time to study DNA. Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, believed that due to the complexity of DNA, it couldn't have statistically formed in the matter of a molecular soup given the Earth's age. It was far too complex, and the Earth was too young to have given the time for the DNA to form. He believed that it must have formed elsewhere and made its way here via panspermia, or, as Crick personally believed, that an intelligent civilization intentionally seeded life onto this planet. Nevertheless, Crick could not accept that the DNA molecule had evolved on this planet. Uh, he felt that there just wasn't time. From Crick's point of view, the Earth solidifies as a planet four and a half billion years ago. It's cool enough to support life by 3.9 billion years ago. And by 3.8 billion years ago, there is bacterial life all over the planet. I had to do some research into, in, into the mysteries of, of DNA and to try to understand what DNA is and, and, and what, it, what it might be. And the first thing that came as a surprise to me was to learn that, you know, I thought that, that modern science had really got DNA taped and that we understood it completely. And the Human Genome Project seems incredibly impressive. Hundreds of worthy individuals all around the world combining their efforts to kind of unlock the secret of the human being. And then I discovered that actually this only relates to about 3% of, of our DNA. And that's the 3% of our DNA that is gathered together in our genes. And all the rest of the DNA is referred to as junk DNA, uh, as though it has really no function. It's just there sort of accidentally. How do we explain in evolutionary terms the preservation of supposedly random, non-real and useless information? How does evolution select for that. It, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's true when you consider how biologists, geologists, and physicists view the universe as a mechanical entity. Life being the result of the accidental process of the machine-like cells that accidentally sprung consciousness into existence. Due to their mechanistic nuts and bolts view of reality, they have created a kind of bias that renders any other explanation for the formation of existence as pseudoscience. Given the knowledge that we have about the quantum nature of reality, it would be logical to apply these concepts to the genesis of biology, not just the fabric of the outer cosmos. What I'm saying is instead of seeing DNA as a mathematical accident of random blobs lumping onto one another, instead of seeing the formation of galaxies and planets to be a mathematical accident of random particles bumping into one another, what I'm saying is that the formations of particles and cells are the reactions of interdimensional actions causalities. Rupert Sheldrake calls it morphic resonance. Simplified, morphic resonance states that there exists morphic fields that shape the form of biological organisms. Much like how electromagnetic fields, gravity, dark matter, and the forces of the universe shape the galaxies, stars, and planets. These fields are directly correlated to phenomena associated with consciousness. Morphic comes from the word morphe in Greek, which means form or organization. So a morphic field is an organizing field, and they organize atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, organisms, societies of organisms. All things in the known universe are the result of an infinite field of energy resonating to a certain vibration. Each specified vibration configures the fundamentals of reality to take form. In our 3D reality, the infinite field of energy takes the form of the dark matter fractal field. 
The dark matter fractal field is a theory synthesized by a number of theoretical physicists, mathematicians, and biologists. Essentially, the universe is a fractal, meaning all things in the universe, atoms, cells, you, me, the planets, and stars, are parts of a whole. It's a different way of viewing the nature of reality, and it makes more sense if one takes the time to study fractal geometry, dark matter, quantum fields, and sacred geometry. There is as much evidence to support the claim that the universe is random and that life is an accident as there is to support the claim that the universe is designed with intelligence. Experiments with sound could make things a bit more clear. Cymoscopes are machines designed to generate sound. If one were to distribute sand or any other granule over the surface of the machine and activate it, one would see that the sound resonance forces the grains to take specific geometric forms. They are forming into the 2D image of a sound wave. So when we come to galaxies or solar systems, we expect to see the same principles. The morphic field of the galaxy presumably coordinates the shape of the galaxy, the form of the galaxy. Um, it helps to interrelate the stars within the galaxy. Each galaxy has an active galacti galactic nucleus. There's a kind of power center at the center of each galaxy. No one quite knows what it does, but they seem to power the galaxy. Um, and it seems to influence the way the whole galaxy develops. Now, we have no idea what a galactic mind might be doing, or what the goal or um, the towards which the galaxy is moving, uh, because physics simply describes the physical shape of the galaxy. It doesn't look into their purposes or forms. And the same goes for stars. I mean, the, su the sun, I would imagine, has a kind of intelligence, the, the entire solar system, a kind of mind. Think of this as the analogy of morphic resonance, a resonating field vibrating at a specific frequency, pulling the molecules together, forming the first DNA double helixes. The source of this resonance may very well be the reactions of the actions within the same space, but within a higher dimension. It's not too far-fetched to think that DNA's complexity was the result of some kind of interdimensional morphic field, much like how the complexities of atoms and molecules were formed by interdimensional quantum fields, electromagnetic waves, and such. There was a linguist back in the 30s, his name was Zipf, and he is, um, he's responsible for Zipf's law, which has detected in all human languages uh, a hidden deep structure it results in a straight line on a graph, that you have um, a, a very specific mathematical relationship between the rank of a word and its, uh, and its frequency. Um, and and uh, this occurs in every human language, and it's identical in every human language. Doesn't matter if it's Mandarin, doesn't matter if it's Inuit, uh, you know, it can be English. It, it, whatever the language is, that hidden mathematical structure is always there. And the very weird and strange thing is that the identical hidden mathematical structure is found in junk DNA. It is not found in the DNA in our genes. It's found only in junk DNA. Um, and, and when I talked to Eugene Stanley at, at Boston University, who, who first exposed this peculiarity and asked him what he thought it meant, he, he, he said, I think there's some kind of message in, in our DNA.